So we're going to switch gears. Um, you know, a lot of the morning was spent uh, with our guests uh, from Aqua. We're talking about uh, Drupal as a, a product, um, publisher, internal, uh, agile development, et cetera. Um, this afternoon, we're going to focus mostly on, on mobile, mobile development, uh, responsive design. Uh, we have a panel a little later today. And to kick that off, we have uh, Josh Clark from Global Moxie. Uh, Josh uh, works with a lot of media companies for developing iOS apps. Uh, he also wrote the book uh, Tapworthy, uh, which for is for iOS app design. Uh, so please welcome Josh. Thank you. Real pleasure to be here, not least because for lunch, grilled cheese sandwich toasties. I got to say, I, I feel good about the prospects of this company, and for I mean, that's that's pretty good. I feel like so. Uh, how you guys doing? You look good. You do. You look good. Uh, so you might have heard about this thing called mobile, right? It's pretty exciting. But it's also, I would say, been for the last few years kind of a huge pain in the butt, right? I mean, you guys were working on mobile. Who thinks it's, it's been sort of a, a crisis, right? I mean, like a lot of crises, it's also an opportunity, which is a good thing. And what I mean is, by an opportunity, sort of a way to, to, to write a lot of problems that we've been doing in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to the web, we've been building stuff the wrong way for 10 years. And the mobile crisis has kind of shown how and revealed some of the cracks in our processes and the ways that we think about uh, web strategy. And, and, and that's also carried over into app strategy, too. So as, as we've been confronting all these things of how do we deal with all these platforms, all these screen sizes, is it web, is it native, what do we do with all this stuff to, to confront this, this demand, this consumer demand? I think there's also uh, has revealed a lot of opportunity. I'd like to sort of do that by looking at uh, some of the ways that we've maybe been doing things uh, kind of incorrectly, I would say. I've got some suggestions for how to approach it and some suggestions also about how we may not have been thinking about uh, mobile as both crisis and opportunity in quite the right way. But first, I'd like to start off with a little bit of anthropology. All of us are anthropologists here. Anybody who uh, deals with creating any kind of product or service, we have to understand our our clients' culture, right? our customers' culture, their needs and expectations and behaviors. Uh, to provide solutions for users, you know, we have to understand all that stuff. right? So there's a little bit of anthropology involved there. As I've thought about the range of mobile cultures, all the different attitudes that we bring to our everyday mobile use, both as a content provider as well as consumer, I've realized that we often have this really sort of simple and even kind of condescending view toward what mobile is. Uh, and that every mobile user in particular is the same as the next. And for some reason, it always involves, the story always involves public transportation, right? We're designing for the person on the bus who's not paying any attention. That's part of the reality of mobile, but certainly not the full picture. So I think that we have some really stubborn myths about mobile users, mobile use cases, that are frankly sort of screwing up the way that we provide mobile services. And I would even argue making our own jobs harder. So I'll be talking about that a little bit this afternoon. Turns out we have lots of mobile mindsets, not just one. And these break down across platform, across personal demographic, across personal context. Where am I during the day? We tend to over oversimplify those mobile needs, though, and boil them down to these really simple, oversimplified use cases. Uh, and so in doing that, I think we risk building down dumbed down apps and web experiences that actually, frankly, can patronize our users more than actually help them or get the message across that we're trying to. Uh, so what I'd like to do uh, is look at how we really use mobile apps and to consider a better way to approach building them. And when I talk about apps, I'm really talking about applications writ large, right? Websites as well as native apps. So I want to dispel seven stubborn myths about mobile use. Uh, and if you're ready, I'd like to sort of start with the, the biggest myth from which all the others tend to emerge, which is this one, that mobile users are rushed and distracted. And we certainly are sometimes, right? I mean, we certainly do have that use case where we're just sort of fumbling with our phone when we're on the go. The, the word mobile actually does us a disservice, though, because mobile is not just on the go. You know, we aren't just designing for these stunted 20-second interactions. Uh, you know, mobile is, is the couch, and it's the kitchen, and it's the three-hour layover where we have tons of attention to spare, and we're, we're very involved and invested in the experience on that little screen. Or, you know, in more private conditions. A recent survey told us that 40% of 
of people admit to using their phones while in the bathroom. Interestingly, the same study reveals that 60% of people are liars. So I don't know. There you go. But this idea, this persistent idea that mobile is for sort of this rush to use case uh, leads to this knee-jerk assumption that mobile is also the light version, is the companion to the real experience on the desktop. Uh, and that's a logical leap, right? If they're in a hurry, well, we should give them less. Uh, but it's actually, I think, doesn't, doesn't particularly hold up. In a retail context, there's a recent survey of online retail shoppers in the US, and 85% of them said that they expect the mobile experience to be at least as good as a desktop. And a significant number said, even better, more efficient, get me to my goal faster, uh, which suggests that our job is not to willy-nilly strip out useful features for the small screen, because we, we, we know how that goes, right? We've all been there. Go to a website on our phone, and it looks great, well designed for the small screen. But wait a second, the one piece of content, the one feature we're looking for, not there, right? You know the drill. Swipe, 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 swipe. Oh, here it is. Full desktop version, right? And you're swimming in this giant site, trying to navigate this thing, and it undoes all the great design thinking that went into the small screen. So we do everything on our phones now. Anytime you say somebody won't want that on their phone, you're wrong. You're making a mistake. Uh, and so let me, let me talk a little bit about why. You get some examples like this, right? So Libris is a bookseller. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's kind of like what Amazon used to be in its first days, really sort of small format media uh, that you, know, you mail order. So you've got things like, like books, movies, TV, music, video games, CDs, DVDs, small format objects, right? But the thing that makes them special, the reason you would go here instead of Amazon, is this thing up here at the top right, rare and collectible books. They have this big network of booksellers where you can get any book that's been long out of print, great, right? So it's, it's sort of rare book, used booksellers. So, like you'd expect, they do have a mobile website. But look what's missing. No rare and collectible book section. The one reason why you would go to this website uh, versus Amazon is not even featured on their mobile site. And the product manager explains... Uh, her sort of explanation for this is, well, we did this with the best of intentions. We want to simplify that mobile experience. We understand that people are in a rush on mobile and that, frankly, they may not have enough time to do the involved search that we need to find a rare book. Or even better, they're probably going to be in too much of a rush to make that economic commitment that you need to make to buy a rare book. But friends, i got to tell you, eBay sells over 2,000 cars a week through their mobile devices. It's also where I get my private jets, great deals on private jets. <laughs> Several Ferraris a month through eBay's mobile experiences. So this idea that, oh, they're on a small screen, I'm going to make a whole set of assumptions about what that small screen means is, is damaging. In this case, it means you can't even buy this book on the small screen. And then maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Because what you can always do is just, you know, when you get back to your desk, to your real computer, you can just do it there, right? No harm done. Maybe mobile is just a niche that we can sort of ignore there. The thing is, is that not everyone has a desktop computer anymore, and that number is growing. Uh, we're most familiar with that story in the developing world, right? Oh, it's great. And the developing nations get it. They don't have full computers. They're using their phones. We're sort of familiar with that. But it turns out that it's true in the developed world, too, including here at home. In the US, it turns out 31% of people who use their phones to access the web almost only use their phones, rarely, if ever, hit the desktop. That amounts to about 15% of American adults pretty much never use the desktop. 36 million people will only see your content on the small screen. So the idea that if you're going to sort of pair that out to peel off content and features, that's denying that experience to a huge swath of people. I was talking to a big magazine brand across the street, and it, you know, your audience development people are probably telling you similar things. They found that over 20% of the visitors to their website are only accessing it via mobile. 
ow, all right. So this sort of is like, this isn't a companion. This is the experience for a lot of folks. Uh, so these are the new computers, you know? We have to be sort of expansive in our thinking to think big about the small screen in a lot of ways. These are not just companions to the real experience. Which, I've sort of been talking about this. This is the second myth that I want to talk about. It's the idea that mobile is less. It's not less. As we begin to do everything on our phones, and as I said, in many cases, only on our phones, then mobile content and features should be at least at the same level as other platforms. I'm not saying, you know, we hear the term mobile first a lot. It doesn't seem to say that mobile is better or superior or more important than other, than other platforms, but it certainly means that it's not worse either. These are all peers now, right? So mobile isn't light. Mobile isn't less. Uh, this happened about uh, a few months ago. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this guy. His name is Jacob. This is Jacob Nielsen, who is, I should say, you know, has done a huge amount of great work on the web. I have a lot of respect for this guy, despite what I'm about to say about him. Uh, and he's, a, he's, if you're not familiar with him, he's been sort of a web usability guru from the get-go and before the web for all kinds of software designs before that. And he gave, and still holds to, some really miserable advice about how to approach mobile interfaces. So for all the respect I have for him, I would say he's just dead wrong on this particular issue. His advice is that from the start, you should build a separate website for mobile. It should be your default experience with the express purpose of giving less content and less features. Uh, cut features that aren't core to the, to the so-called mobile use case, as if that could be so clearly defined. And then for the few users who need that content, who need full content, the few users, never mind those 36 million people who will only see it on the small phone, make them sort of swim around in the big website experience. So what does this look like in practice? Well. In a blog post, he gave this advice, which is that the feature set should be much smaller for a mobile site. And an example is a company's full site typically includes PR information and investor relations sections. But you know, on mobile, just eh, kill it. No, Jacob, stop. You're hurting the interwebs. Breaking the interwebs here. I mean, what he's doing here is, is he's He's, uh, he's saying, first of all, that, that with research and testing, that people often are overwhelmed by too much information on the small screen. I see that too. But his prescription for that problem is just to kind of lop off limbs, right? And I would suggest that there's actually sort of better design work that we can do to solve that issue rather than just say we can't allow access to huge swaths of, of content. What he's doing, though, is confusing context with intent. All that we know about somebody who's looking at, a, at, at, at your website on a small screen is that they're looking at it on a small screen. And yet we make all these assumptions about, oh, they're on a bus, they're in a hurry, oh, they don't want to make a purchase, oh, they don't care about PR and investor relations. It might be that people don't care about PR and investor relations. But that means it doesn't belong on any of your websites, right? If it's not good for the mobile user, it's not good for any user because it's, we're the same people, right? Uh, so I think the mistake that we often make with mobile is focusing exclusively on its enabling and unique characteristics, the fact that it is portable, the fact that it has maps. Oh, it's, low, it's mobile. We've got to like load it up with maps. You know, it's like focus on that as additional features, not limiting features. So again, the idea that... Uh, I want less just because I'm on a small screen. It's a bit like an author saying, oh, I'm, I'm writing the paperback version, so I guess I'll just leave out some chapters because it's smaller, right? So it's, we shouldn't tie, again, this notion of device context with user intent. Device context does suggest new op opportunities and possibilities and perhaps priorities, but it should, that shouldn't be a limiting factor, right? Don't arbitrarily give me less. Often, though, we, we try to give less in the, in the name of simplicity, which is a great cause. We want to create easier, simpler experiences for our users, right? Uh, and simplicity is great, don't get me wrong, but removing too much of it can actually be kind of condescending. In fact, I would say that we should embrace complexity. That's this third myth. 
that complexity is necessarily a bad thing. You guys, complexity is awesome. You know, it's what gives our lives richness. It's also what lets us as designers and developers solve hard problems for people. If our interfaces and our applications and our websites can't embrace a certain amount of complexity in chat, they, then they can't sort of help our users take on complex situations. People don't want dumbed down apps. They want uncomplicated apps. And here what I'm suggesting is that complexity and complication are different. Right? The complexity is about richness of experience, whereas complication is about sort of the difficulty of, of engaging that. So in the same way, you know, simple and simplistic are different. Complex and complicated are different. So busting the myth of the distracted user means figuring out how do we create complex but comprehensible apps, right? And that's not always so easy to do. I mean, say that you were going to build an app to fly an airplane. You know, you might start here. This seems like a logical place. Uh, but it turns out that for a lot of users of this app, they probably want something more like this, right? How do you get somebody, how do you figure out what somebody's goal is and get them there as quickly as possible? Now understand, this is a specific use case. This is more sort of like the driving the car case. I don't need to know what's happening in the engine under the hood. But for other people, having that, the complexity of all those dials, you know, there is some segment, some audience segment who needs, who wants that stuff. So part of it is understanding how much complexity does my audience actually want? And then how can I remove the stuff that people don't want to be you know, sort of exposed to and help them get to their goals as quickly as possible? This might seem like sort of a trivial example, but bear with me. This is my favorite weather app. Uh, it's an app called Umbrella, the simplest weather forecast. And it says, and it answers the question, do I need an umbrella today? This morning it told me yes. I'm not somebody who particularly cares about the weather. And, you know, I, I don't look out at it sort of days in advance. All I really want to know is, is am I going to get wet if I go outside without an umbrella, right? So this is perfect for me. My stepfather, however, is like a weather nut. He's like one of these guys who watches like the Weather Channel, like, I don't know, 18 hours a day. You know, he's like talking about the humidity. You know, it's a low pressure system in Brazil. How about that, huh? So it makes me nuts. But he, for him, he would look at this and he wouldn't even recognize it as a weather app, right? Weather is enormously complex. And someone like my stepfather, Ken, wants to be exposed to it in all of its complexity, right? So how do you, so for me, you know, this is great. This is like, oh, okay, this is a great mobile experience. Blah, blah, blah. For me, this is just a great weather app. Forget about mobile. But how do we get all of the complexity of the weather into a small screen like this? Well, this is AccuWeather.com's iPad app, and I would say they do, they do not handle complexity well. First of all, a little scary, right? Even the sunny day is scary. <laughs> but more important, it's got like all this information, too much all at once. This is the main screen of the thing, and it's loading me up already with what the wind speed and direction in six days is going to be. I may want to know that, but is that really my first, sort of first order of business? Look at how much information I have to parse just to sort of get the basics. I think you manage complexity not by presenting it all at once, but more by managing it through give and take. And a lot of times, one of the great things about starting with the small screen, like how do we provide that full experience on the small screen, is that it's hard. And it makes you do better thinking about what's really important. It makes you do better design work. So it's not uncommon. AccuWeather.com's iPhone app is actually sort of much more elegant and better considered than sort of the iPad app where they, they had more room to be, frankly, lazy, which all of us will do. We got more room to be lazy, we'll be lazy. That's, that's what we sort of, uh, you know, that's human nature. Starting at the small screen makes you, makes you do sort of that, that close, hard work. So let's take a look at this. So first of all, this is the home, the, sort of the first top-level screen of the app. And there are lots of information on the current conditions. Ken, my stepfather, is in hog heaven here, right? He's got his dew point and it's precipitation and stuff I don't even know what it means. He's psyched. So how do we go into the future? Let's just swipe into the future, right? And then what we have here is the summary information hour by hour, starting with what's coming up at the next hour of current conditions for 7 a.m. But I also have useful information, really familiar, right, in the weather context of icon and 
and uh, uh, temperature. So I know I sort of I already have useful information here. What's happening at 10 a.m.? Just ask the app. What's happening at 10 a.m.? And it tells me. What this is is sort of interacting with actual useful information and then blowing it up to sort of see more. Requires more taps than just dumping all of this data on you directly, but each screen is more digestible. I think this is important. It's true in all interfaces, but especially in a mobile interface. Clarity trumps density. You know? That gives the lie to this fourth myth, really, that, that extra taps and clicks are evil. The web has given us this squeamishness about additional clicks, and with good reason. You know, when this whole Fandango started back in the mid to late 90s, you know, wow, clicking on a link, it was going to be a good 45 seconds or a minute before you found out what was on the other side of that thing, right? And network conditions on mobile sort of return us to thinking about that kind of, those kind of interface performance issues as well. But we're also in a situation where we figured out a lot of advanced caching things. And certainly for a lot of apps where you actually have the information at hand, you don't have that network latency issue anymore. And so when you can remove that network issue, it actually turns out that extra taps and clicks, even though it takes more actions, it's often more pleasing because every screen has its own sort of focus. And it invites conversation. I mean, that, that notion of sort of exploring through the content rather than just laying it all on you at once this is how we typically learn. This format, where you got somebody, you know, flapping his lips in front of you for like 45 minutes and you're pretending to listen, that's not usually how it goes, right? I mean, usually you say something that interests me and then I ask a question about that and you tell me some more. You answer another question about that. It's how we navigate each one another's sort of rich vein of knowledge and personality as well. It invites conversation, give and take. The fancy sort of UX highfalutin term for this is progressive disclosure. Gradual engagement, a little bit at a time as people need it or ask for it. So progressive disclosure is this way that helps you uncomplicate complexity on the small screen, give full content, but present it in chunks for the smaller screen. So you can have a full meal, you just take it one bite at a time, right? Instead of gulping it all down at once. So sort of other sort of quick sort of simple example from the app world on this. It's an app called Momento, which is sort of a micro journal app for uh, iOS, and I believe it's on Android now too. It's kind of like tweeting to yourself, which is the way that I feel when I'm using Twitter a lot anyway. Like Twitter, it's like, so you have these sort of short entries about what's happening in your life that you just sort of save for later, a little diary kind of thing. Like a lot of Twitter apps, especially early on, you could attach a lot of stuff to your moment. You know, so you've got... You can attach a person or a location or a bookmark or a tag or a photo. You can even rate your moment. Hey, great moment. Except look what's happened here. There's so much interface Chrome that there's really not much time left for your moment, right? It's choking out the actual content with all these options that you, you have there. Uh, Twitter, before they totally over, overhauled their app and I would say made a lot of bad decisions when the app used to be called Tweety, had this really sort of simple notion of saying, you know what, let's focus on the content, on the primary task, which is just getting that tweet out, right? They had this sort of second option that they basically swept all the secondary features under the rug by you could sort of tap the character counter as a button and then the keyboard would slide away and you could then see the options underneath. There was a discoverability issue here because people weren't figuring out that that was actually a button that you could interact with. And so what they did is they actually in a subsequent version, made it so that you would start here with this view, and then it would sort of wait a beat, and then it would slide up, and there would be a little animation on the button, and then you could start doing your, your Twitter magic. That's fine, except for at, over time, after you've learned the lesson, it's annoying to kind of wait for that animation. So the, the sort of the next phase of that, sort of where they, uh, or where I wish that they would have wound up, sort of the next level, is to say, oh, you know, especially with phones, too much one user per phone. Once they've interacted with that thing themselves, lesson learned, stop the animation. Right? So I think that there's a, a little bit more listening that we need to do to our users to watch their behaviors, figure out what they've explored or not, and then introduce that as we think about progressive disclosure, when to show things and when not. But this idea is focusing on one sort of primary task or piece of information per screen, and then sort of pushing secondary actions off to other screens. And 
Clarity trumps density. And I would say tap quality also trumps tap quantity. So as long as every tap is a quality tap in a mobile experience, so everything leads you and is sort of the, the scent of information remains strong, leads you down this direct path where every tap gives you additional information or a completed task or even just a smile. And that's sort of a, a quality tap. And I wouldn't be so worried too much about the quantity of them. So again, as I was saying, this idea is not to arbitrarily strip out features and content. I think it's a matter of organizing and prioritizing them instead. And in fact, rather than thinking that mobile means less, I sort of challenge you to think about how can I do more with it? Because these things can do more than the traditional computer, right? They're just like packed with all these features, camera and microphone and GPS and gyroscope for crying out loud. How do you put these things to work? especially as mobile browsers hopefully more and more actually get access to all of the, 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 the device APIs and, and gadgetry that native apps get. My point is that you should stop thinking about mobile content. Stop thinking about what people won't want on mobile. That your content necessarily has to be wildly different on mobile because you're going to be wrong about that. Instead of mobile content, I really think it's about thinking about mobile devices or any device for that matter. What can this device do with the content? You know, if you, in, in a web context, if you start with a really basic website and then you use feature sniffing to layer on mobile only tools, whether that's touch interactions or location information, the camera for the, the mobile browsers that are able to use the camera, progressive enhancement for super powered devices. So you're sort of layering on new features onto this basic and already pretty complete web experience. So progressive enhancement of a single web page for all devices, that brings us to the fifth myth, which is that you got to have a mobile website. And don't get me wrong, like I've been saying, you've got to have a great mobile experience uh, on every kind of device, desktop and phones and tablets. And voice, how does your website sound? You know, hopefully all of you have been sort of thinking about uh, what the web experience is for the visually disabled, designing for screen readers. I have a hunch that for a lot of you, like most places, it gets sort of swept under the rug. A small audience, we don't necessarily need to worry about them as much. It's a shame, but it's often a reality. But as voice actually becomes more and more mainstream, we're sort of seeing with things like Siri, still called beta by Apple, by the way, and boy, does it feel like it. But you can see, wow, speech is right around the corner. We've got to be designing for all these different experiences. And soon, you know, obviously TVs, more and more people starting to browse the web on their Xbox or, or their smart TV, and frankly, devices we haven't even imagined yet. For all these things, presentation has to be somewhat different, but not necessarily the content. Perhaps the priority is a bit different. But yes, you do need great mobile experiences, but I would argue not necessarily a separate mobile website. This is sort of what Jacob Nielsen's idea was, right? Always have a separate mobile website so you can give people less. They're going to love that. I think the important thing to realize is that there is no mobile web or tablet web, or desktop web. It's just the web, right? Enhanced to suit specific devices. But you know, I'm, I'm the same person no matter what device I'm using. We've all had that experience that I described where you know what, you might not want that feature all the time on mobile, but man, when you want it, you're bummed out that it's not there, right? Uh, means we can't think of different websites for different devices. The mobile web is not some independent thing. So don't think in terms of a mobile website. Instead, how is this single website experienced on mobile devices? Web experiences, not individual websites. And this applies to ad experiences right now, too, I would say, especially as we sort of move to responsive websites where it's just one single site. We've got to start letting go of this idea of selling ad properties into different devices, especially when it's the same website. right? I mean, mobile versus tablet versus desktop, selling entirely different ad properties and pricing, doesn't really make sense. Devices are not market segments. I am the same person whenever I, bring, whenever I come to this same website. There are, I think that, as we're going to talk about later, and lots of technical problems to, selling, to, to sort of dealing with ads in a responsive context. But I would say there's a big cultural and sales problem there uh, that's sort of rooted in this idea that we have had separation. And frankly, that's not the user experience of this stuff anymore. This is just the website. We've got to start thinking about how do we sell advertising into the website, not 
into different devices. Because again, devices are not market segments. Stop siloing ad sales across devices. All this stuff is this one web idea. It's not about the user's context, in other words. Are they mobile? Are they not mobile? But what they want on mobile? Are they more or less valuable for ad sales on mobile? But really the device context. What can the device do? How can the device enhance the experience with all the stuff that it can do or can't do? So if we build by thinking about progressive enhancement using these techniques of adaptive or responsive design, uh, then I think that that's, that starts to get us there and makes us future-proof, at least future-friendly. If we can't know the future, we can at least sort of prepare for it a bit. So in an ideal world, and man, we certainly don't live in an ideal world, but in an ideal world, responsive design is the answer, right? Serve a single HTML page to all devices, use media queries to design for common formats, JavaScript sniffing to layer on new functionality onto the website, whether that's GPS or touch or voice or eventually camera accessibility, you name it. That's the ideal situation. But you know, I think it's important also not to be dogmatic. I think that, that should be our starting point. But there are often lots of reasons why we ne can't necessarily embrace it. Sometimes those are business reasons. Sometimes, wow, that advertising problem that we're talking about, that's intractable. What is going to happen if we start selling all of our ads, if we've, if we've been able to get this price on desktop and this price on mobile? What happens to the underpinning if we haven't really thought it through yet, if we sort of merge those into a single site? There can be business reasons, organizational reasons, political reasons, certainly technical reasons why it's like, wow, this just may not work if we try to do everything all at once. So I'm not trying to be dogmatic here, but I am trying to set our ideal, which is, man, your very first assumption should be this should be responsive. And then you should create an argument for why that, then it's on you to figure out why it, it shouldn't be. Because I think going forward, it's sort of that's, that's the default. So my sort of argument, sort of to put out that Jacob Nielsen thing early on, is like that's just the wrong default. Sometimes it may be right to have a separate mobile website or tablet site, whatever. But that shouldn't be our default. We sort of got to keep our eye on the prize and what, what's important. Again, it's not, it's, it's not worth being sort of dogmatic about this. I think in, in a lot of technology cultures, you do get this religious fire around things. It's responsive design is a means, not an end. It's not our goal to make a responsive website. Our goal is to make a great web experience. Technique deprecates. You know, I mean, the way that we have been building websites has changed a lot in the last two or three years. But that happens all the time. We're all the time pitching overboard the stuff we built. It's, it's, it's principles and values that endure. And in this, uh, this case, it's how do we get our content out to a great experience to as many people as possible? That's the goal, right? So whatever you choose, in every case, I believe our initial question, our default position should be, can we do it with one website? Uh, and you might find that you can't. Uh, but just don't do it. Whatever you do, make sure that your reason for not doing it is to specifically give people less, which is sort of the Jacob Nielsen position. You need a separate website so we can give them less. Don't do that, right? It's like I'm on a phone. Don't hate me. That's the way it feels, right? You get a website on a phone, it's like, why do you hate me? Uh, this isn't our intent, but it's what we do. You know why we do it? Often because it's convenient. Let's a sidestep hard design problems. You know, don't avoid hard design decisions. Don't use false notions of user context to, to avoid the, the crux of it, which is often, gosh, this is hard to do. That's our jobs. That's why they pay us our mediocre salaries. <laughs> is to you know, sort of solve those hard problems. Making those decisions makes your service better because it lets you do this. You know, edit your stuff down. Uh, my friend Luke Rablewski coined the term mobile first a few years ago, and it's come into like, like a lot of popular terms. It's, it's come into a lot of different sort of understanding. But his initial idea was this. If you start with mobile and all the hard design problems that you do when you sort of start at the small screen, it forces you to really confront, do we need this stuff? It's really hard to get it in here. Does anybody even care about this? I mean, as our screen sizes have gotten larger over the last decade or two, we've taken it as permission to put more crap into the website, right? And back when the beginning was 640 pixel, sort of when people were designing for the web, it's like, great, that's sort of one column of tidy content. 
But as we added more columns, you guys, the third rail of every content, of every website, is full of crap. You know it. You know it as a consumer. You know it as the people who are being like, what do we put in this space? How about some crap? <laughs> right? So thematically similar content and features across all devices doesn't just mean that we should throw the kitchen sink in there. You know? So I, I would say that uh, this business of uncomplicating complexity isn't easy. And all of these sort of content and features, though, as, as we sort of think about that, challenging that complexity, taking it on, may not be so important. Uh, so mobile should do everything, but it shouldn't do everything, I'm saying. right? It's like when it, I'm saying that your mobile experience should do everything that your desktop site hat does. But maybe your desktop site shouldn't be doing all that stuff. Maybe your desktop site is sort of full of crap. So don't carry that into mobile. And actually, starting in mobile helps you clean that stuff up for other platforms as well. So focus and winnow content on all platforms, not just because of the size of the screen, but because you know what the user actually want or need. So we've got sort of mobile or not mobile, one web or separate websites, platform decisions. Are we doing iOS within iOS? Is it iPhone or iPad? Both web, desktop apps, Android, SMS apps, text-based apps, still a really powerful marketing platform, but also print television, voice, all the traditional media. So we've got all these platforms and cultures that we're trying to confront and address, which means this is a really thrilling, but you know, overwhelming time. I would say we sort of feel that as consumers sometimes trying to keep up with this stuff, but certainly as the people who are trying to put this stuff out there, find our path through all of these different sort of roots of reading, reaching our, our customers. That suggests that we need to step back from that whirlwind for a moment and stop thinking so much about individual platforms. Stop focusing so much on apps or on individual websites. Because really, frankly, to deliver rich, complex experiences to all these contexts, and here's where the Drupal stuff really comes in, you have to start with your content. You know, so if, if you look across the entire range of devices and interfaces and seek out the commonalities between these things. You know, what's the range of service you want to offer? You'll find that floating above all of these cultures, all these like specific little containers for your content, tying them all together, is you. You know, it's your company, your goals, your service. And that's embodied digitally by your API. I mean, the API is the application. Like I was saying before, all the technique for presentation, we throw that stuff out all the time. It doesn't mean it's not important. This is what our users see. This is what they engage with, is these interfaces that we build, these containers that we make. But you guys, we throw that stuff out. It becomes old really fast. And the stuff that endures is the content, is the service. And what that means is that we need to start, stop chasing the containers so hard at the expense of actually designing the content that underlies it. Because if we design the content better and we build the awesome Drupal system under the hood, to serve that content, we're going to be ready to be able to move really quickly through this churn of, of applications and websites, these little containers for our content. So the big boy in the room here is thinking about your interfaces as a spectrum of apps that plug into a single wellspring of service, of content. If you build a common back end that can serve all these interfaces, lets you turn and pivot to each one of these little cultures, to each technology, to each device, you know, that's the win. It's not mobile first. It's not desktop first. Content and API first. Which brings me to this sixth myth. that Mobile is about apps. Or if you're a web partisan, it's not about websites either. But this is the stuff that has us running hard all the time, right? Apps, 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 apps. Websites, websites, websites. At any moment, we tend to focus on a single container, because that's what we do. That's what we build, an app, a mobile website. From a strategic level, those, you know, this is all tactical stuff, right? Uh, that's what's got us running in a panic, though, right? Got to have an app. Got to get on this tablet. Whoa, new Samsung six-inch phone. Got to be ready for that. Where does that fit in? Uh, Got to have that mobile website. You guys, this. An app is not a strategy. It's just an app. Same for a website. You know, your product is not an app or a website. It's not really any of this stuff. It's not, a, it's not an app. It's not a website. It's not a news feed or a book. It's not a TV sort of stream. It's not a newspaper. It's not a product at all. You know, your product is something called content, and this company has a ton of it. 
you know, how well is it organized? Because the rest of the stuff, the apps and websites, are just these containers. So stop focusing so much on apps. It's not sustainable. There aren't enough of us in the room to keep up. I mean, the, at the pace at which new screens and new platforms, new technologies are coming up, you know, it's fine to sort of change out your website every couple of years for, for the desktop. But now it's sort of, wow, all these different devices, it's making our heads spin. And there are, like I said, aren't enough of us to design every touch point that our users have with our, our content. We can't start from scratch and design pixels for every point that our content reaches our, our viewers, our readers, our users. You know, I've said this a couple of times, but I think this is really important. You know, presentation gets out of date fast. Technique de deprecates, but principles and content and ideas last. So let's design according to principle, according to content, and not according to presentation. Which brings me to the famous UX designer and content strategist, Bruce Lee, uh, who said this. He said, content is like water. You know, you, you, you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put it into a bottle, it becomes a bottle. Into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. He was sort of saying this in a, in a sense of you have to be ready to sort of adapt to any circumstance. But wow, that's what we're dealing with with our content now, right? How do you make content like water? It's going to take many forms, flow into many different containers, many of which we haven't even imagined yet. For a long time, our content management systems, well, back before the web, were in these awful legacy content management systems, right? We finally managed to move those into a web content management system. But what, which web? Well, a desktop web, and often very inflexible content formats. So we sort of blew it a little bit there. But now we're sort of learning and saying, oh, OK, it's got to be able to go into all these different kinds of containers. If we build from the content out instead of the container in, that's where, what our misstep has been in the past. So if we build a common back end, Drupal's a good start, to serve any interface, if we stop thinking about apps or websites and start thinking instead about flexible content, flexible services, CMS has to be agnostic about these kind of platform machinations that make us crazy day to day. We need these clean content repositories to deliver more neutrally formatted content to be displayed on any device. You know, we've got a lot of them. There's this growing mainstream expectation that you can simply get all of your content from any device. We expect content to flow seamlessly, to follow us throughout the day. So this ad for NFL.com, for example, I think is this crisp illustration of that shift. So I kind of want his TV. But uh, this guy, by the way, this is sort of one extreme, right? I was saying earlier that we also have this other extreme of, of people who only have their phone. Um, and often that's, that's sort of a, um, a digital divide issue. Because people are confronted with, wow, you know what? I can only afford one screen, or more important, one internet connection. People are choosing their phone in a lot of cases, is what we're seeing. The other extreme, we've got this guy who's got everything, right? The question is, what device are people coming to you with? And the answer is, we've got to meet them wherever, whatever device they bring. Um, and, and this sort of gets at this expectation that we expect the content to just follow us. We access the same content across multiple devices now, whether that's phones or PCs or tablets, Xboxes, TV boxes. And we, we have this growing, as I said earlier, mainstream expectation that it will follow us from things like Netflix or uh, or Kindle, or all the TV everywhere apps that you guys are building, where it's the kind of thing where it just knows where I was. Reading on my Kindle, and I pick it up over here on my iPad or my phone when I'm waiting in line someplace, and what? It knows right the page where I left off. Netflix, it remembers where I left off no matter what device I'm on. I want my stuff everywhere. And that means, frankly, that we're all cloud developers now. Uh, even the most modest and mundane seeming apps need to talk to the cloud to remember who I am or where I am. Lots of arguing about native apps versus web apps among the folks who build this stuff. Totally appropriate debate to have as the builders. But man, our customers don't care. 
you know, that's an implementation detail as far as they're concerned. Say that, you know, it all converges in the cloud now, both behavior and, uh, and presentation. And so just about every app should be a web client of some kind. Native apps are, right? It's all HTTP requests talking to an API behind the scene. Again, API first. Now, whenever I talk about API and structured content, especially to sort of business or marketing folks or designers, there's a little bit of a relief in the room. It's like, oh, okay, API and structured content. I can go check my email right now, right? Or, you know, this is a good time to duck out. That's for the database nerds, right? I'm glad you asked because that's the last myth I want to talk about, that this stuff is for database nerds. Designers and managers and content producers, we all have to care about this too. And I would say not just care, but get involved. It's going to make all of us better at our jobs if we start caring about content design, workflow, storage, transport. The database nerds have been shouldering that stuff for us for years and doing a valiant effort. But it's not fair because they don't always see the whole sort of picture of the business or the content or the design considerations which means that everyone gets frustrated when sort of like the design of the API hasn't embraced sort of the different things it needs because it's like, oh, I need to put this piece of content up there. Can't do it. It's not indexed. And we've all run into that. So the solution is, you know, we all need to get involved because this is about how to maintain some kind of creative control in this really chaotic environment that mobile has created. Uh, if we can sort of do a better job of sort of pushing our design skills down the stack into the content itself, then we'll have the metadata that we need to describe content, be able to sort of make these calls so that no matter what interface we're building, native or web, it's something that can sort of be pulled into and be, and be designed appropriate to the device. So a quick example of that, and we can also, happily, we can sort of help the robots to help us by doing this better. So, to so show this last example, and I'll close this, close this thing out. This is a Guardian's front page, their print edition. And like a lot of newspapers, there's a lot of editorial judgment that's embedded here, right? And we're familiar with how it works because, you know, we're used to print conventions now. But we know that the most important story here is this one on the left. Second story, even though it's got this big picture, is kind of here on the right. Down below at the bottom is third. And even though they're at the top, we understand that that's fourth, fifth, and sixth across the top, right? A lot of times when we move to a digital format, we sort of throw out all of that information that's embedded here, in this case, in, in the print edition. Uh, reverse chronological order, I guess, right? Which sort of means that we lose all that editorial judgment that's there, or we have to hire a whole other editor to reassemble, reapply that editorial judgment. We lose that information. When you look at the Guardian's iPad app, you see that the information is still blocked out appropriately, right? You see that it's sort of the number one, number two, number three story. There's more stuff on the iPad's front page than on the print edition, so more things appear on it. But you see still everything is represented there from the top. They didn't do this by hiring an editor to do this stuff. Instead, they had the robots do it. They built an automated script that analyzes the InDesign files, which is XML under the hood, to analyze for size and placement of the articles and then sort of calculated a priority number that went back into the content management system. So when the robots go out to build the iPad app, they have all the information they need. So the editors are still working in this familiar canvas of the print design. And yet, because they've sort of introduced this useful metadata of describing the content with some priority, it actually pulls out so that the robots can build the website better here. Because our goal is not to repurpose design, which we often say it's like, well, how can we make everything look the same across platform? That's not the goal. You know, we don't design pixels, we design content. You know, so Guardian kind of bucks the trend of so many print publishers who try to pour their print design into iPad. Uh, don't make that mistake with your website too. So the real win, I would say, for business value, for creative control, for empowering customers to be able to use whatever device they want. For maintenance, for sort of sanity, and from a technology point of view, it's to create content strategies and design strategies that aren't tied to any single presentation. Because in the end, it's not your app strategy, or your desktop strategy, or your web strategy, or your mobile strategy. It's just plain strategy, right? Who are you to your customers? How do you give us a, 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 a consistent content experience across the board? So just to sort of see what we've done here. Mobile isn't Rush, 
It is sometimes. We do need to design for that consideration of when it's rushed. But that's not the only experience to design for. Because it's not less. In fact, I would say mobile is often more. How can you do more with these super-powered devices that can do so much more than the desktop good? That means that you have to be willing to embrace some complexity and design for it and understand that while I want uncomplicated experiences, or at least as uncomplicated as possible, understand how much complexity people actually do want and give them full access to that. It means understanding that tap quality is more important than tap quantity. Clarity trumps density in any interface, but especially in mobile. Keep it focused and let people get to additional secondary content on, on other screens. It's just one website. I think that's important. I think that we're sort of starting to recognize that from a technology point of view and a content point of view. And the next sort of really hard challenge is tackling that from an advertising point of view. Uh, that's a hard corner to turn, not least because that's where the money comes from. You know, how do you sort of make this transition without overturning the apple cart? Hard problem. But one of the sort of big advantages of sort of starting with mobile is that it can bring focus to other platforms. So especially sort of with responsive design, a common pattern, although not always right for every project, is to start with that narrow width. How does this work uh, for the phone? Because it gives you that opportunity to get rid of all that crap that winds up in that third column of every website. It's not about apps and websites. Right? It's about that underlying service. We don't, all of us, very few of us, have the opportunity to just blow up our content management system and sort of start with the content and design that whole API. Uh, but at least you can sort of do no harm. And with every project, as you sort of think about adding a new feed, gosh, you know, maybe this can be sort of a middleware, sort of the new API that we can put in front of our content management system so that we can solve problems for new platforms that will follow. Think about the service and the API uh, as you think about that front end. Finally, you know, this is an interesting quote that a, a, a kid, a New York designer, 19 years old, said to me. You know, it occurs to me, metadata is the new art direction. And that's not to say that art direction is unimportant, but it is to sort of say that, wow, the data, the way that we describe our data, hugely important palette for us as designers, as content producers, and as product owners. And that's the sort of stuff that we've sort of kicked to the side, to sort of say, oh, we'll let the database guys do that. Hugely important role. Thank you, database guys, for carrying that for all of us. The rest of us need to be in on that conversation, too. I love you guys. I do. Uh, so let me just wrap up by saying this gently. You know, our jobs are getting harder. Uh, we're designing for a jillion platforms. We're inundated by screens, this little rain of glowing rectangles. That's not going to change. In fact, it's going to increase. So we kind of can't sweat it. Simply the environment that we work in now. To accept it and understand it, and know that we have to give up some control. Uh, sometimes letting the robots take over for us, right? If we can get rid of some of these stubborn myths that we have, not only about mobile, but how ex people experience media, but how we consume content in an era of connected devices, and if we accept that stuff, then you know, that really releases us, gives us some freedom to go out and you know, kick some butt. Because seriously, you guys, we have the coolest job in the world. And I would say that's especially true in this media environment where we're solving really hard and interesting problems about how people engage in the world and in the media that so fascinates all of us. So I think, you know, this is one of the most exciting times in the history of technology, and I would argue in the history of culture. So if we embrace the uncertainty that we face and think big, I think we kind of can't help but make something amazing. So thanks very much, you guys. All right, I guess we do. I'll take some questions. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Westgate. <laughs> hey, Josh, thanks for the talk. Um, it's really inspiring to hear this. You know, I, I, I uh, had heard uh, mobile first and, and a lot of conversation about mobile first, but this talk seems to me it's, it's almost like content first. And so how does that translate to the database nerds, to the robots, where you know we're having technical conversations, and what's the other voice that needs to be in the room that says, what would content do? What does content need here? And how does that influence the technical conversations? No, it's a great question. And you know, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, you know, mobile is this crisis that I think can be an opportunity to begin those conversations. Because I think that there's a lot of frustration on product teams, on marketing teams, on editorial, where it's like, why can't we get this stuff out there? 
hey, tech guys, what's up? How hard can this be? Why can't we get our, our apps and websites out? I think that that's a moment to sort of say, well, we actually, we need your help. Because if we can kind of get this structured data in, if we can actually sort of be smarter about the way that we deliver content and store it and transport it, we can help you guys look more awesome. And I think that that argument has often been made at the wrong, in the wrong way in the past. And it's human nature to talk about it in terms of our needs. Hey, it would really help me do this, my job better, if we could actually design the content better. And nobody gives a crap what would make your job easier, right? But if you can tell them how to make their job easier, or even better, how to tell your boss how they're going to get their bonus, a bigger bonus at the end of the year, you know, that's the way that we think about it, right? So, hey, editors, I know that this is a little bit more work to sort of get this additional kind of content fields filled out. But you know what? It's going to make a, help us make your stuff look better on an app. It will help you reach more people, and it will look more awesome. And that's sort of true for sort of every role is that this is a, a, a win across the board for a little bit of investment in time and sometimes in money, uh, but it's the thing that will make you future friendly, if not future proof. So the considerations are, I think that there are sort of design considerations that are just sort of like, how can we be, what are, the, what are the important bits of this content that we're trying to describe? And how might we want to be able to use this flexibly as we think of arbitrary screen sizes or platforms, or even in some cases, no screen at all? Uh, so I think that those are design and editorial conversations. Those are certainly product conversations. And it's, it's the kind of thing that um, we just need to get better for the folks who are sort of non-technical at saying, oh, you know what? This actually is part of my job. This is how, this is, this is by describing the work that I do, I'm able to actually create a better product at the end of it. How's it going? I recently heard uh, Karen McGrain talk at the uh, OPA summit. Very similar themes. Sure. She just wrote wrote a book, you know, on, on very similar theme. I guess how do you help organizations like ours determine what the right metadata is around content? You know, like news sites are news sites are news sites, and I feel like there hasn't emerged a standardized set of metadata. Um, when there feels like it, it should be, and we, we all are doing all this normalization behind the scenes of feeds we're ingesting, feeds we're outputting, and then different partners are asking for different feeds and different meta information. Is, is there emerging some standard? And what are your recommendations around that? So I wish I could say that there was a standard. I mean, we've got things like NewsML and sort of some sort of description sort of ways to describe kind of common news. I would actually say that news and media organizations are actually in a lot of ways better at this and, and better positioned uh, in this than a lot of other industries in that there's already sort of pretty well described kind of conventions uh, for television to sort of share out to listings things sort of you know that there's, there's already some pretty good description around things. We could use more conventions but uh, like with a lot of standards there are often so many sort of exceptions to the way that you want to use it or that sort of fits your content, that frankly the stuff tends to uh, break down after a while or become so complex that it's not useful to, to anybody. I mean, this is, this is sort of the, the, the challenge of fitting standards to uniquely individual situations. Uh, so I wish that I had sort of a way forward there. I mean, I think that there will be sort of industry standards that evolve. And I think that particularly as you kind of think about um, that the Drupal community can be uh, helpful here in terms of sort of saying, hey, this sort of module, this adaptation to Drupal is something that fits a, a broad use case. Uh, and so that I think that there may be sort of some standards things, but I think that in, in some cases it's a matter of, wow, these customizations to Drupal can be sort of automated to get you there 80% of the way. I think that's something that, that Karen would say, uh, and by the way, that sort of metadata quote that the 19-year-old kid, Ethan Resnick, who said that, was, he said that to both of us at the same time, and I think sort of knocked us back on our, on our heels a bit. I think that the thing that uh, Karen would say about um, uh, uh, sort of most installations is that any, you know, a lot of times I know that she's asked a lot because of content strategy things, well, so what, what CMS does this? What, what system should I use? The answer is all of them will get you sort of 80% of the way, and then ultimately there's got to be sort of some customization that happens because all of our content is sort of unique. Uh, I wish that I could say that there was a better industry solution. I, I haven't seen it yet, but I think that actually sort of at, almost at the tool level may be a more useful uh, way to approach it than even at sort of the standards level. 
Okay, one more. Huh. Great presentation, by the way. Oh, um, how do you balance, uh, when you talk about mobile, mobile equals more, not necessarily less, how do you balance putting more content on a device, even though the network speeds have gotten better, in terms of performance? Yeah. Do you find that users are willing to wait longer if the pages, not at all. they're not? Yeah, not at all. There's no, we, we're becoming more impatient, if anything, I think. And you, and you see this enormous drop off for even a few seconds of wait. Um, a little bit of tolerance on mobile, especially if you're sort of going through some network, some spotty network. But if it feels like a slow website, incredible drop off uh, in things. And you see studies like this all the time where even microseconds can, can create, you know, sort of several percent drop off. So one of the interesting things, I think we'll probably be talking about this a little bit in the responsive design panel, is that um, we're sort of at the point of trying to figure out how this stuff works. And we sort of figured out, wow, all right, we've, we figured out how to make a website go into all of these different screen sizes, or we figured out how to get this just onto mobile in general. Where we're at, and this is sort of natural in a technology thing, is sort of in the polishing stage. That's true for design, where we sort of have kind of this sort of blocky and sometimes flat design style as a result in responsive, we're sort of trying to sort of take that to the next level. But crucially, I think, in performance. Like, how, what are the strategies that we can use to improve performance? And a lot of times, I think it means not shoving everything down the pipe in one go. Uh, and so a pattern that I'm sort of seeing, it's, it's uh, uh, called, uh, my friend Scott Jell has called it uh, aggressive, um, uh, uh, aggressive enhancement, is to actually treat some of the content itself as an enhancement, particularly secondary content. So you put this great sort of first experience, sort of by default, the default experience that everyone would see down the pipe at once, and then sort of identify spots on the page that you could sort of add useful but secondary content, and particularly content that's maybe useful to one device or another, bundle that all up into one HTTP request, pull it down, and spray it around the page. So it's not a huge delay, but it means that you've got that first sort of page experience in place very quickly, and then sort of deferring secondary experiences. And I think that those of you who are working with comment systems, for example, especially third-party content systems, have learned, wow, we should not do that in the first, in the first request, right? We should defer uh, uh, comment request if you're using something like live fire or discuss or something like that, because those are awfully slow. And so I think that that's a way to think about uh, certainly some services that may be slower to load, but also secondary content. It's like pull that in in a second batch. That's part of our next sort of V2, sort of second generation of responsive design is figuring out how not only to be responsive, but responsible uh, with performance. Performance is a huge part of user experience. I mean. Don't take that lightly. That's like a huge part of user experience. That, that's it, right? Thank you, guys. <laughs>